Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad to have you with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Jim Garrity joins us today, as we said yesterday, from the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. He'll join us from there tomorrow as well. Uh, Three big stories to talk about, Jim. And yesterday we mentioned at the very, very end that we knew that sometime yesterday afternoon we would find out who President Trump was going to pick for his running mate this time around. We were pretty sure it wouldn't be Mike Pence. Uh, and there were a lot of other names on the uh, on the short list, but uh, it's the name you said last Friday. J.D. Vance, the freshman senator from Ohio, famous first as an author, a best-selling author of Hillbilly Elegy, and the reaction drew uh, a number of reactions. And Trump's base, it's, it's a very popular pick. It's kind of a reinforcement of, of his approach on a number of issues, including economics. For more traditional conservatives, it's uh, it's a little more frustrating on issues ranging from uh, foreign affairs to uh, even the right to life, which he he is. But just uh, a couple Sundays ago, after President Trump said he was fine with the Supreme Court decision on the morning after pill, uh, J.D. Vance suddenly said he was as well. Here's what he said. On the question of the abortion pill, what so many of us have said is that, look, um, we we certainly don't. The Supreme Court made a decision saying uh, that the American people should have access to that medication. Donald Trump has supported that opinion. I support that opinion. And then in terms of of the tactics here, Jim, some people think it's a Midwest guy. A lot of Midwest states uh, are going to be a big deal here. Others saying it's now it's more about being in sync ideologically. So what do you make of the pick? You you clearly saw it coming. Yeah. um, For those wondering how I was able to have a Washington Post column uh, out so ready is that, look, you know, I I pre-wrote vast chunks of that. uh, And I was prepared. I'd started one on Burgum and right around midday yesterday. When, when one by one they started being told Marco Rubio was told you're not the pick you can almost picture him not getting a rose um, in this very you know reality TV style uh, Marco Rubio gets told you're not getting one Greg Burgum gets told you're not being one and there are various rumors going around it's going to be somebody who's going to surprise you it's going to be somebody you don't expect and I sort of like okay it's Youngkin so I start writing up something on Youngkin although I, I'd kind of been skeptical from the beginning and then I, there was this rumor going around somebody saying she's ready and you sit there and like, you know, at least Stefanik had not been gone through this, the vetting. Uh, you start going those. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, God, what if it's Tulsi Gabbard? Trump wants to unite people. He's going to pick a former Democrat. Uh, we've seen her gut Kamala Harris like a fish on a debate stage. You know, like <laughs> I could talk myself into it. And I'm like, I'm going to have to write a column about, you know, Vice President Trump, like Tulsi Gabbard. Thankfully, I hadn't gotten too, star- too far when Trump announced it on Trump Social. I, ironically, this is somebody who had been in the running from the beginning. It really shouldn't be that surprising. Um, and yet it was a little bit surprising uh, for the electoral reasons, which I'll talk about in a second. I'll, I'll start out by being nice and I'll say, first of all, if you really want to hear the sales pitch for uh, J.D. Vance, go read my colleague Michael Brendan Doherty, who is a um, just effusive fan. Uh, and that's right in his sweet spot of exactly who he wanted. Um, and it's not like J.D. Vance doesn't bring any impressive qualities to the table. Anybody who's read Hillbilly Elegy or seen the movie or even just read the reviews, the discussion of the book, know that J.D. Vance came up from some very tough circumstances, not just poverty, but just just a vortex of dysfunction around him, rising above it all. Uh, and that's what kind of you know, um, went to the Ohio State University. And my apologies for the post column mentioning it as simply Ohio State. My understanding is that Brutus will throw uh, acorns at you if you uh, or Buckeyes at you if you don't call it the Ohio State University. Then goes on to Yale and gets a Juris Doctor. He, he's a bright guy. I think anybody who listens to this guy knows he is a bright guy um, and who can articulate the Trump message, Trump message quite well. Starts out as a guy who was very skeptical of Trump and who can make a probably there's a certain amount of political expediency there, but it's very hard to believe that there isn't some genuine change of opinion uh, in his shift from being really overtly, loudly, never Trump to coming around. Um, And I can see the argument if you feel like, you know, okay, you wanted the blue wall states. He's not from a blue wall state. He's from Ohio. But um, if you're really worried about turnout amongst blue collar whites, then this probably helps reinforce it in places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and, uh, and Michigan. So it, it's conceivable this helps a little bit in the Electoral College, probably on the margins. I just feel like everybody else helped more. Um, and I think also, this is very clear, this is an ideological, philosophical pick. Uh, can't help but wonder, having Trump having been through this near-death experience, it did make, you know, make him think about his successor. 
what is the party going to be like? What is the MAGA movement going to be like when he's no longer around? And I think he can say, probably feels, it's in good hands if J.D. Vance ever has to take over. Um, now, that having been said, this is a guy who's, as you mentioned, you know, not as, you know, a little squishy on certain issues. Economically, he's worked with Elizabeth Warren a lot, a lot more than you'd like uh, if you're a traditional conservative Republican. Uh, said he's okay with raising taxes, uh, you know, um, they, they referred to him and Elizabeth Warren as a power couple uh, by Politico a little while ago. Um, you know, not an economic concern. And he's, he's downright isolationist and probably for the interests of repelling Russians in Ukraine, the worst possible pick Trump could have made. So, uh, you know, I see I was, I was not doing cartwheels. I was not thrilled. There was just kind of this. Ugh. And I think both for the purposes of the election and just for, you know, they, like there's there are a whole bunch of Nikki Haley voters out there who, who if you pick Youngkin. You pick Marco Rubio, you pick Tim Scott, even even Burgum. You know, all those probably help you at least a little bit with any wavering Republicans. Vance doesn't help you with that. This is a declaration by Trump. He doesn't need to broaden the, his appeal. He doesn't need to broaden the party. Um, and again, if he was up by, he's he's looking pretty good in the polls. Uh, this is this is a good optimistic mood at this convention right now. Um, you know, the president just had a near miraculous escape of an assassin's bullet. Uh, polling looks great. The Democrats are at each other's throats d- debating. You know, things are really good. And maybe you can afford to make this pick there. Um, but there's, if, if Trump falls short, I think there'll be a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking, a lot of second guessing, saying, huh, was this really the pick who could really help put him over the top? Um, or was a little overconfidence at that moment? And only time will tell. Yeah. When you talk about one of your biggest priorities being in sync ideologically, it, on the flip side, it means that there's not a lot of people ideologically that Vance draws in that weren't already uh, enamored with uh, with Donald Trump. And you mentioned the economic policies. You know, last night we had the head of the Teamsters Union up there bashing mm. right to work on oh, stage God. in co- corporate America. Uh, it's a new Trump. Or, I, mean, you know, I was going to say, Greg, but like, do we, are we nominating Mondale? Is, is this the 84 <laughs> Democrats? Seriously. Like... You know, ah, right to work. That's just the worst. Yeah. You know, <laughs> look, you know, this way, the, the Teamsters had better endorse Trump because that was a really sweet plum to give to uh, to the Teamsters right there. So we'll see. Maybe it makes electoral sense. But, um, you know, and look, I, you know, it doesn't mean you have to hate unions, but like it, there, there's a, you know, this is a very different party than it was just even eight years ago. Definitely disappointing uh, on right to work and some of the other things. That were said, and then they also put Amber Rose in the one hour of prime time that the networks were actually yeah. carrying the convention. I, so I'm not I mean, sure that what the planning was there. I guess it was uh, trying to trying to win over people who wouldn't normally vote for Republicans. Well, but I, I I will just say Amber. You know, I'm, I'm going to start by saying something nice, Greg. Uh, her remarks were perfectly fine. Uh, she told a story about her father serving in the military and how her father had been a fairly pro Trump person, and she had been very skeptical. She did her own research. And uh, came around to persuade that, you know, Donald Trump is actually a good guy who wants to, to help the country. I'm just going to observe, Greg, if I ever say I should get something tattooed across my forehead, stop me. Because <laughs> I had a very hard time concentrating. And, and this is not the aspect of Amber Rose you thought was going to distract guys in the audience. You, you figured it'd be something different. But I, and I don't know what it was, but it was just one of those things like, what is, is, is she selling advertising up there? Is this, you know... I think it says we've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. I don't know, but anyway, it was. She uh, her, her, the text of her speech and her delivery was perfectly fine. It just was um, not your father's Republican Party, is it? It wasn't last night, and last night the theme was making America wealthy again. Uh, earlier, because you know I'm more of a political junkie, I guess, than just watch the one hour prime time. I thought Glenn Youngkin was uh, was very strong. I thought Marsha Blackburn gave a really good speech, kind of contrasting. The difference between uh, Trump and Biden's economic record just before that last hour of prime time. Uh, Byron Donalds did OK on education, I thought. Uh, so there were a lot of good moments, but uh, curious as to what they really wanted to feature last night. I haven't done the research, Jim, but I have to think that the age gap between Trump and Vance has got to be the biggest, certainly in our lifetime and maybe ever. I mean, it's 38 between 38 and 39 years. That's basically double Vance's age. That, that, that's that got to be up there with, you know, George H.W. Bush and Dan Quayle uh, and maybe, you know, McCain and Palin. But if there's anything I learned last night, uh, it's the importance of doing your own research, as Amber Rose taught us.
Yes, yes. So maybe somebody can correct me. I think if they were to win, he'd be the youngest VP since Nixon uh, in 53. So uh, in any event, there was another big age gap, 20-some years there between Nixon and Ike. But uh, So we will see how the rest of the convention goes. Uh, I think most of America probably doesn't have a real firm grasp on who J.D. Vance is. So Wednesday night's going to be kind of important for him uh, to tell his story uh, and, and why he's decided to join uh, with Donald Trump on this particular ticket. So a lot of anticipation for the J.D. Vance speech, Trump's speech as well. But you don't have to wonder whether it's going to be good if you've ordered a Moink box. It is one of the great feelings to know that there's a Moink box on your porch with the fantastic meat that you've ordered, including the greatest bacon I've ever had. But it doesn't stop with the bacon. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and even sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon. They bring it right to your door. The Moink difference is a difference you can taste and you feel good knowing you're helping family farms stay financially independent, too. So choose your own meat, ribeyes, chicken breasts, pork chops, salmons, and so much more. I love the Moink box, and I know you will, too. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash martini right now. And listeners to the Three Martini Lunch get free bacon for a year. That's one year of the best bacon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. Spelled M-O-I-N-K box dot com slash martini. That's moinkbox dot com slash martini. All right, Jim, on to our bad martini now. And it's basically the same one we had yesterday as it relates to the Secret Service. Some of the latest things we've learned come from Olivia Rinaldi of CBS News. And this is her thread on, on X. Stunning new details from CBS News on how Secret Service snipers noticed the shooter before the Trump rally on Saturday. There were three snipers stationed inside the building the shooter was on, according to local law enforcement. One of the snipers inside saw crooks outside looking up at the roof, observing the building, and then disappeared. Then he came back, sat down, and was looking on his phone, and at that point, one of the snipers took a picture of him. Then the shooter took out a rangefinder, and the sniper radioed to the command post, and the shooter disappeared again and came back a third time with a backpack. The snipers called in with information that he had a backpack and that he was walking toward the back of the building. Officers believe that the shooter might have used an air conditioning unit to get up on the roof. By the time other officers came for backup, he had climbed on top of the building and was positioned above and behind the snipers inside the building. Two other officers who heard the snipers call came and tried to get onto the roof. State police started to rush the scene, but... By that time, a Secret Service sniper had already killed the shooter, according to law enforcement. He apparently also had an IED in his pocket. So literally, you've got uh, snipers underneath the roof that this guy's laying on, and they were apparently clueless that he was up there. And then uh, yesterday at the White House, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas Hey, what's your level of confidence in Kimberly Cheadle, the head of the Secret Service? I have 100 percent confidence in the director of the United States State Secret Service. I have 100 percent confidence in the United States Secret Service. And what you saw on stage on Saturday with respect to individuals putting their own lives at risk for the protection of another is exactly what the American public should see every single day. It is what I indeed do. Yeah, the question wasn't about what happened on stage. It's what happened in well, actually, wait, out the place. Go ahead. Greg, Greg, can I interrupt? So is he saying he, every single day we should be seeing Secret Service agents rushing to get the a presidential candidate off the stage after he's been shot? That's what he wants to see every day? That's that's the success story he wants to say? <laughs> I don't think that's a success I, story at all. Yeah. But given, I, given his own track record at the border, apparently mm. uh, success is not something he's familiar with. I, I, you beat me to the punchline that I was going to say. No, I, I, this guy thought the border was secure for the better part of three years. Um, yeah, no, this is this is really appalling. And I'm just going to point out one previewing our, our, our next martini. Um, there was a question to pre, uh, from Lester Holt of NBC News to President Biden asking, had you talked to the director of the Secret Service? And Biden said, I've talked to him. Right. The director's a woman. And I don't think this is a pronoun issue. I don't think this is they prefer to, you know. And, and Holt then corrected and used the, the, the feminine pronoun. But I genuinely wonder, has tr- Biden spoken to the director or has he spoken to somebody else? Um, I, I, there are certain circumstances where I think in life you're required to fall on your sword. 
we may yet see uh, some sort of consequences, but it's just very hard to say, oh, things worked the way they were supposed to. And for Mallorcas to go out and say, what a proud day. No, no, this is the worst mistakes. You know, the worst, is it, uh, really a first shot at a presidential candidate since Reagan. Am I wrong? Like, uh, that's uh, you know, a hit one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this was a failure from top to bottom. And what's worse is we keep seeing these videos in which lots of other people around there did. Now, yesterday's podcast, I theorized, they're using more local police because they're short-staffed or because they don't have enough manpower to provide the protection they want for everybody with their own staff. Are the communications slower that way? Is there more, you know, layers of checking or something? I, so the, the idea, because you're seeing people saying, ah, oh, you know, this was, you know, the deep state was trying to get Trump. First, if the deep state wanted to get Trump, why would they trust this idiot kid, uh, 20 years old who couldn't make the high school shot team? You know, like, I don't buy into that, but it just, this does look like incompetence. This does look like garden variety, miscommunication, failure to communication, um, nobody knowing exactly what the protocol was, which is like, this, again, you do have one job, Secret Service. This is your job. And so any continuing spin of, oh, we're so proud, you can't have a colossal screw up and then say, no, this is a great job and we're all so proud of ourselves. And unfortunately, we've got it far too often. It, it would be really good for the country if Biden were mad about this. And in that interview yesterday, or even his subsequent remarks, there's been no indication that he's mad at anybody that it happened. Biden got his two statements in on Sunday, and he's he, I think he's moved on for the most part here. Uh, one of the things I thought was a really strong point that Trump made in that first debate, obviously overshadowed by Biden's weaknesses, is when he, he made the point of, what does it take in this administration to get fired? He talked about Afghanistan and the military leaders. He talked about the border, and now we've got Secret Service. So what does it take to get fired? Hold on. Greg, here's the thing. Do you think Joe Biden at some point is going to call someone into the Oval Office and say, all the pressure was on you. This was the biggest moment. Everybody expected you to perform, and you just pooped the bed. You just did absolutely a terrible job from beginning to end. You clearly were not prepared. You clearly were not up to it, and you just can't get it done. It's time for you to go. Like anybody else is say, you first, Mr. President. Come on. <laughs> exactly. But it's definitely part of a pattern. We just uh, move on to whatever the next thing is. Not good. Not good at all. <laughs> All right, Jim, on to the foreshadowed uh, crazy martini here, and that's Joe Biden's interview with Lester Holt of NBC News, which Biden should be very grateful this morning that there was other big news, the aftermath still of the assassination attempt, the selection of J.D. Vance, the start of the RNC. So this is probably not going to get a tremendous amount of attention compared to the Stephanopoulos interview, for example. But kudos to Lester Holt for not pulling any punches here. This first question right out of the box was basically in reference to Biden's call for unity. And he referenced what we talked briefly about yesterday, and that's Biden last week telling donors it's time to put Trump in the bullseye. And here's how that part of the conversation went. You called your opponent an existential threat uh, on a call a week ago. You said it's time to put Trump in the bullseye. There's some dispute about the, the context, but I think you appreciate that. I didn't say crosshairs. I'm talking about focus on. Look, the truth of the matter was what I guess I was talking about at the time was there was very little focus on Trump's uh, agenda. Yeah, the term was bullseye. It was, a, it was a mistake to use the word. I didn't, I didn't say crosshairs. I meant bullseye. I meant focus on him. Focus on what he's doing. So was it a mistake? Was it the wrong word? I don't know. He's uh, mumbling all over the place here. But then Lester Holt says, OK, bigger picture here. You've been in politics a long time. You've been president the last nearly four years now. You've been very critical of Trump when he was president. Have you thought much about anything you've said that could uh, be raising the temperature of political uh, rhetoric instead of lowering it? And of course, Biden <laughs> has nothing apparently to apologize for. Have you taken a step back and done a little soul searching on things that you may have said that could incite uh, people who are not balanced? Well, I, I don't think, look, how do you talk about the threat to democracy, which is real, when a president says things like he says, do you just not say anything because it may incite somebody? Look, I, 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 I have not engaged in that rhetoric. And then he accused Trump of saying the country would be in a bloodbath if, if Trump lost. And that, of course, was uh, Trump talking about the auto industry uh, uh, suffering a bloodbath because of uh, Biden's EV agenda and so forth. But just in case Joe Biden needs a refresher, maybe his memory isn't as great as it used to be. Here's just a small selection of things he said since he's been president. I will not yield. I will not flinch. I will defend the right to vote. Our democracy against all enemies, foreign 
and yes, domestic. Do you want to be the side on the side of Dr. King or George Wallace? Do you want to be on the side of John Lewis or Bull Connor? Do you want to be on the side of Abraham Lincoln or Jefferson Davis? Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. And he was talking about the, the Georgia voting law, which saw record turnout, including among African-Americans. And then the last clip was about his debate performance. And uh, check out the vigor here as he says he'll do better next time. If you were to have continue to run and, and be officially nominated, what happens if you have another episode like we saw during the debate? What happens? If another? Yeah, what, hap- what happens if, if you have another performance on that par, that, on that level? I don't plan on having another for us on that level. All right. Well, Jim, so what do you make of the mumbling, the the absolute lack of any introspection uh, uh, on commentary or anything else? Well, Greg, first, uh, um, okay, so on the first couple of comments, the Democrats are, you could say they're in a trap of their own making. Look, we, we use martial war and violent metaphors in our politics all the time. And nobody is saying we should go out and, you know, oh man, he got, he got, you know, they beat the tar out of him. No one is saying literally on the debate stage, Trump went out and beat the tar out of uh, Biden. That, that is figurative, not li- literal, as our president sometimes needs reminding of that, of that distinction. Um, and, and so we shouldn't necessarily be, you know, you know, they're saying Republicans pounce. I do think it's wrong to say every time somebody says, you know, but uses some sort of, you know, no one was saying, no, no one believes that when Joe Biden said, we got this guy in the bull, you know, in the, in the bullseye or whatever it was, you know, it's time to turn the bullseye on Donald Trump. No one's thinking, you know, he, we should, somebody should shoot him. That having been said, you probably want to avoid it for the next near future. And obviously Biden could not bring himself to do that. I think just broadly, um, what we saw from Biden in that interview with Lester Holt last night, it may not have been quite as bad as the debate, but it was bad. It, it was really bad. I, I think if I had to summarize it in one word, Greg, it would be um, <laughs> it, it was like, did, did the audio cut out? Did, you know. Um, <laughs> and so this is what Democrats have. And I just uh, concluded a conversation with some of my uh, Post colleagues. And it's like, look, the, the super friends of Obama and Pelosi and Schumer are not going to the White House and telling Biden he's got to quit. I know there's been that rumor around. There's been that belief, that hope amongst. There's no indication that's happening. The only way they would not have him as the nominee is a convention fight. It sounds like the DNC wants to do the virtual convention, uh, the virtual delegate call um, like a week from now. So the clock is ticking. There's no indication it's going to happen. Democrats, you are stuck with this guy. You didn't have to be. I mean, it would, have been a, it would have been a very difficult fight, but they could have chosen to say, you know what, we just have no faith in this guy's ability to beat Trump. We're going to roll the dice on Kamala Harris. And, you know, listeners of this podcast know we are not members of the Kamala Harris fan club, but she's not senile and she can handle a, a serious debate schedule, a serious campaign schedule in a way that President Biden simply cannot. And Harris may have her own flaws as a communicator, significant flaws, um, but she's not going to mumble in an interview with Lester Holt. That's, you know. And she'll giggle, but she will not mumble. Yeah, like, she'll, like I said, she'll have her, you know, but like, you know, there will not be a fear of, remember there was, the, you know, some foreign leader where they kind of, I think it was Herzog of Israel, she just kind of pauses and looks at the camera, guys like, should somebody do something? Or, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you just don't have that worry with Harris. And I think that the Democrats would eventually unify behind her and galvanize and at least have a shot in November. It's very, you know, right now, Biden doesn't have a shot. Something could change. You, you could see, you know, Trump could have a terrible moment. Something else could happen. But Biden looks like he's in really sad shape and he's not going to get better between now and November. So it's not quite congratulations, President elect Trump. But I'm just going to observe that, like, uh, you know, Greg, I was thinking about the, the conventions and I wrote about this in the corner this morning. Didn't have one in 2020. 2016, the Republicans were still very divided. Uh, listeners may remember Ted Cruz concluding his speech saying, vote your conscience, not saying yeah. vote Trump, as everyone expected. Right. Year before that, in Tampa, the convention was shortened by a day because of a hurricane. Uh, I mean, who could have foreseen hurricanes in Florida in the middle of summer? Not Michael Steele when he was RNC chair. So <laughs> good job there. Um, 2008, I got tear gassed. I don't have happy memories of that one. And uh, 2004, 
was in New York City. Uh, I think it was a successful convention, but like this, people were terrified that Al Qaeda was going to try something uh, at that point. Um, so I just I think this is the, the happiest mood. You know, reporting to you live and direct here from Milwaukee. Uh, Republicans are in the best mood they've been in decades because their their candidate just miraculously survived an assassination attempt. Aileen Cannon just ended one of the lawsuits against him. The polls are looking great. The Democrat pollsters are warning they're going to lose the House and Senate. This, this is about as good a moment as Republicans have had in, in the national scene in a long time. So it eventually will end. Things will change. News cycles change. But I think um, yeah, if, you're, if you're a nervous Democrat, nothing Biden did last night made you feel any better. No, that's certainly the case. Although once the Democrats settle officially on Biden, the media and, and everybody else, they're going to they're going to close ranks and uh, go hardcore after after Trump. So I wouldn't say that it's over, but it's looking probably better than at any point uh, we've seen so far in this cycle for Donald Trump. Uh, Jim, yesterday we got breaking news that uh, the VP selection was yes. just uh, hours away. Now we have uh, breaking news that Bob Menendez is guilty on all counts in his federal corruption trial. And so uh, I'm sure you're shocked about that one. Greg, who could have seen this? He seemed like such a nice guy and just squeaky clean. Anybody could have had gold bars all across their room and sewn into their monogram pajamas or whatever it was. So, you know what? Look, um, do, OK, we have to do something we usually don't do on this podcast. Right, Greg? We have to say congratulations, FBI. No sarcasm, <laughs> no diehard references, a victory for the opposition party in New Jersey. And um, I, I look forward to the election of a completely different new corrupt Democrat. That's almost certain to happen. But yes, out of all the the great Jim Garrity one-liners over the years, the idea that the Republicans are not the opposition party in New Jersey, where Jim is originally from, but it's the FBI, uh, is hilarious and accurate, as it turns out. Hey, we ask for miracles. (laughs) Exactly right. So, Jim, uh, glad to connect with you today. We'll do it again tomorrow. See you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and tell your friends about us as well. Thanks very much for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us both on X. Jim is at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday and join us on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.